presence of Fun Fables all the more mysterious, but perhaps we can uh, get some answers to those mysteries now, you know, and people can kind of have an idea of what's going on in the behind the scenes of the music and so forth. That's true. There's some, there's some uh, like written articles, but otherwise like, you know, spoken stuff is, there's not a whole lot. Um, uh, your mom pointed out to me that there was you know, there's there's something of me backstage in Poland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these, these folks came and asked me some questions. It's like, oh yeah, we have like dig dig through to find it, you know. Yeah, well then I'd have to give away, you know, the secret that I'm actually half bird. So, you know, these are <laughs> you know, <they're... laughs> can't, be, can't be giving that away. But yeah. <laughs> but so in talking with Nels, we did talk a little bit about uh, some of the upcoming tracks that you have. Uh, there were, it sounds like there was one for a magazine, I think it was. There's like a flexi disc on the way. Is that, is that yeah. accurate to say? Yep, yep. There's, um, there's a, a magazine called Fiddler's Green, a fellow named Clint Marsh puts out. I think he's been doing it for, I want to say like eight years or so, seven to eight years. Um, and it's... It's something that I've uh, really enjoyed, and I I feel aligned with because he has a lot of a lot of focus of things that are just kind of slow slow time uh, out of time, um, a lot of old lore, a lot of very um, kind of naturally you could call mundane uh, magic uh, to life, and um, he's from the same generation as me, and. So yeah, he contacted me and asked if Fawn Fables could contribute a song that they've been adding a flexi disc to their issues now. So this issue isn't, um, it's not out yet, I believe, but it's um, its gonna be the next one out and he's hoping to get it out soon. So yeah, and this issue is, um, it's all basically um, fantastical, uh, fiction, folkloric. I think there's going to be a lot of stories and things. So he thought of Fawn Fables and it was perfect because I've wanted to start working on um, some fairy tales, like to work on stuff, especially dig into the lore and find things that lesser known fairy tales that, that, I, that I really love. Um, and there's been this one book about Midsummer Tales um, by a, a librarian named Ellen Green that I've really uh, loved over the years and one story really resonated with me um, and I've been wanting to start on it and it just gave me this this um, this project and this deadline with Fiddler's Green just gave me the the structure and the opportunity to dig in so I wrote what could be seen as kind of the theme to the story it's a very it's an elaborate story that it goes on for a while. Like each bit of the story could be its own, you know, book really. Um, so the challenge was how to, how to kind of do a bit of a summary of it, um, but to have enough of the details that I think make it really wonderful. So I hope I've, I hope I've captured that. Um, and it's a little bit like the Gilligan's Island theme where, you know, it gives you the context of the basic story. It's, it's you know, it's kind of wordy. And and then from there, I'm just going to continue, um, continue writing and see what develops. Um, I think it could definitely be a whole story, a whole like song, song cycle, little operetta or something. You think we'd be hearing that on the next Fawn Fables album, Continued, maybe, as a concept? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, possibly. We do have other songs um, that we've been recording and that are in the works and, and ones that need to be recorded, like their their time has come. Like we're kind of, 
I think we're almost caught up with all the stuff that we've we've toured over the years and um so this I would like to put this song on the next album and probably embellish it more than than what you'll hear on the Fiddler's Green flexi disc but it's also possible that if it really takes off as a story I might want it to be a separate thing but we'll see though that's that's a pretty cool idea. I've always really been attached to the stuff you've done that has been the storytelling oriented. Of course, I always talk about being when I was ten years old, seeing the Transit Riders show was very influential for me, and of course that was a whole concept as well. Um, has that been something you've been finding yourself gravitating more towards in, as of late? Yeah. It, yes. It. You know the urge to to tell more of a, an actual story comes and goes. And I have been feeling like it's time to do another, another one. Um, yeah. So I think, I think this story could be a, a good, a good contender for it. Um, yeah. And it's, it's the kind of thing that you, you go into it and it's a lot more work and it can be kind of a bigger, bigger headache in a, in a sense, but it's also the satisfaction runs very deep. Um, so I, I did some work a year ago on a friend, um, a fellow named Dalrymple McAlpin. He's based in the Nevada City area. And um, he's been putting out these um, kind of fairy tale operas. Um, he's put out a couple in the last, you know, several years. And most of the people in my family were were cast in the show last year and during that time i i started to feel myself um desiring to have a show but to be putting my own writing into it and you know developing it and how it just that satisfaction of of having having the performance exist on a, on a few more levels than just playing the the, the music um but having like uh, staging and, and, and character and um, costume and um, yeah so I, I think it's I think it's time <laughs> yeah I, I like that it's also uh, going further into sort of as more of that mystical context uh, as that you talked about fairy tale sort of a thing because that's always been one of the great things about your music, I feel like, is it really feels like it doesn't come from this time in some ways, you know? There's sort of this other other world, other time feel to it. And that I, don't, I can't think of a whole lot of other artists that have that feel, you know? Um, oh, that, that's, yeah, that's, um, it's it's true that that's, that's been a big um, interest. And I'd have to say that it's something in a way that's, you know, a desire to kind of, a resonance that has been felt, I know for me, like my whole life and has even been at times a troubling feeling. And it's kind of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a spiritual path, if you will, um, which includes various things, but I've always felt the desire to, to kind of dig into the uh, kind of visceral reality of fairy, you know, and, and to look at what um, in these, in these traditions, cultures and things that that have it more um have it have it stronger and more resonatingly uh, even in modern times you know trying to trying to explore and see what are the roots what are the roots of it um and i'm not someone who has necessarily seen a whole bunch of fairies in my time i i know people that that have had more sightings i've had a couple i've had a couple situations um all, all that to say that um, I think that the the realm, the notion of fairy is something that's um, a pretty vast thing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I could see that. And also it's, uh, yeah, it just seems like that's always had a, an interesting place in the in the music of Fond Fables, even going back to the earliest work. And did, did, was that something that was uh, influential in uh, even like early song era music? Or did that come more so later? Did kind of the vision of what Fond Fables would be seem to become more solidified later on, do you think? Or? Yes. Yes, it was, it was more solidified after early song. Early song was, it was, it was like the, the collection of 
the first songs that I was doing and able to play and sing myself without a band and separating from playing with bands and not playing an instrument and not being able to do a whole lot of my own writing. I mean, it was more just collaborative, improvisational jams that, you know, then we took bits and songs would come together. But um, I really had to kind of leave leave that scene. And I was doing some different, like, kind of cabaret things, some circus sideshow stuff with the yodeling. Um, and I had to leave that to be able to just find my own uh, vision and, and voice. So early song was the very first songs that I could I could play and it was a desire to kind of make a, a kind of a demo of sorts, um, especially because I, I was traveling overseas uh, for the first time. And I just had, I had various, I was kind of flowing from one situation <laughs> to the next. I had a couple um, musicians, numbers and contacts that I had landed with, but from there I just kind of took it and just, just saw where, where things opened up. and. Um, ended up spending a, a good, profound uh, time in um, in Ireland. Um, that was that was very influential. So from there, then came writing. That later, maybe within like a year after that experience, um, became Mother Twilight. So that was the first one that I was actually just e expressing, like the vision, you know, expressing my own my own vision and. Um, figuring out the equipment and, you know, recording it um, largely myself and then having, you know, the Nils, Nils was there too. That was the first really like digging into some original stuff. And early song was more like just like the early, most of the early songs I was exploring um, as a soloist. Yeah, I think it's interesting that first time that the title is early song as well. It's sort of it knew what it was even at that time, you know. <laughs> right, this, right. this is kind of the title that you would think it would have if it was being released much later after it was recorded, which is kind of I think is interesting there because it just seems to establish that there was an awareness that the vision had yet to be solidified in a sense. Right. And there's also a bit of a there's a definite nod to just early song, like early um, kind of ancient, you know, like people, um, people doing, you know, oral, oral tradition and, um, yeah, that feeling of kind of an elemental connection with, with singing, which is also how I felt about it because I was just really kind of exploring my, my voice, um, in a more exposed way. Cause I had, I always had fun making a lot of sounds and I could always make a lot of sounds growing up and I had older siblings that would be that exposed me to a lot of, you know, interesting singers and um, and I heard some uh, great classical music, very impressionistic classical music and Bartok. And later on, I realized how much that was a real melodic influence for me. That, that was the stuff that I felt the most at home with and it really resonated with me. So then when I started writing, that was the most magical kind of stuff that I wanted to, to draw upon. Um, Anyways, but of course, a lot of great rock singers too, and um, and uh, yeah. But I had I was making sounds with bands, but it was all very kind of there. Was, there was nothing very uh, well. It, it was a little more just on a total wild, loud, you know, every every big soup of instrumentation, and you know, very very free form, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and and some fun, some fun, just like rock kind of stuff. But this was like continuing the exploration and just really distilling it down and just so I I felt very like elemental with you know in in my in my singing and and, and my relationship with my own voice. Oh wow! I have, it's interesting to hear that too. I had never thought about the fact that the title had the multiple meanings like that. But it does that it does have to, uh, does take on a whole new meaning here from that perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah, Mother Twilight, though, that was the first one I remember hearing songs from, of course. And so that has a lot of formative uh, songs on it. And uh, yeah. the family album as well, of course, those two I remember in particular as, you know, being a kid and hearing those and kind of them shaping that time in, in their own kind of way. Um, yeah. But I, I, do you find that nowadays, since 
you've made so many more albums since then. Is it harder to, do you intentionally uh, try and not focus on the older albums too much when putting together a set list? Or is it something where it just depends on the night, it depends on the tour kind of a thing? Yes, it depends on the night and it depends on the on the tour. Um, it sometimes, I, I look to, I'll look to, sometimes I'll actually look at the albums too to just remind myself of what all is in, the, you know, what are, what are in the song lists. But there's always been some other songs too that aren't on the albums that have been on other tours, uh, sometimes covers, sometimes songs that never made it onto albums. And I'll kind of, I'll try to make, a big collective list of the songs. Um, you know, every every couple of years, kind of refresh it, and and I'll just have that with me in my in my my tour folder. Um, and as we're getting ready to head out for a tour, I'll look at that list and and just think what what resonates with me. Like, what do I feel excited about singing? Because I it is nice to have a bunch of uh, different things to choose from. And then always, um, whatever new material is on the wing, try to give time to work on that. There's definitely been some tours, especially when the kids were really young, where um, there wasn't as much time to really work up new material. So that it's been more like exploring various chapters of old material. And it's it's been nice to have a, a, a big catalog for that reason. Yeah, do you tend to... Uh think about it in terms of like when you're putting kind of going through the albums is there any time you kind of look at it as then okay we need a song with this mood in the set list at this part yes that kind yes. of thing sometimes i'll make my my big kind of master lists of of the songs uh based on mood more than you know than the album um and then, yeah, that's that's a really nice, convenient way to make a, a set list. If like, well, I don't want to put too many of these, this mood, all back to back, you know. And or sometimes it'll also be like wanting to give a rest for my voice. Um, and then it's really nice to know that there's a bunch of songs that either Nils sings entirely, or he does the main, he carries the main load, and so then I can I can take a break. There was actually a time period, I think it was on the, the family album tours, where so much of the songs in family album are really intensive uh, vocal for four, <laughs> vocals singing for me. Um, and I would just, I would lose my voice like every, gosh, I don't know. Um, it seems like I lost my voice a lot during the tour. I would have different, it would come and go, you know, like there'd be some point every week where that was like, well, that whole range I can't get to. Like that was just much more common. And um, I realized that that material, you know, you, you can't, you can't have a set night after night that has you singing like really intensive, you know, full out like high belting, <laughs> <laughs> singing you know especially when the singing really is one of the main things we're doing like it's it's a lot of like singing heavy stuff you know so I changed from that um, I try to mix up and make sure there's not just like song after song after song that are really intensive for you know for the singing for the vocal cords I, that is a big part of it I you know with the voice it, it only can take so much throughout a show uh, is, so is that something that is a change in your kind of philosophy towards singing or is it partly uh, a change in the voice naturally over the years where, as you say, it just kind of came to a point where you're like, you know, this register is not what I'm doing. Uh, it doesn't come as naturally or that kind of a thing. Or, or was or was it maybe sort of an intent of like, let's not push it as far in the studio because then you won't have to do it this, that way live and things like that. Right. right. No, I always, uh, I don't, I don't let, um, the the performance ever be limited i'm i'm still always trying to find what are some nooks and crannies what are some adventurous pathways i haven't tried with singing like for that it's always always the adventure um but i think something happened with well i think my my voice um matured getting older helped i was able to um just i wasn't losing my voice as much but also it was a matter of what like like curating your your set list for the actual tours 
And just trying to like trying to mix it up and make sure that you're not putting too many back to back really intensive ones. But as far as like in the writing and in making you know recording the album like now full let's you know full throttle with <laughs> you know total ad- adventure on, on that part of it. I've, I've never never wanted to hold that back. Um, and I also noticed too that I used to get sick during tour more. Um, I would always get some kind of a cold and sinus infection you know there's always one point in the tour where the poor people of that you know those particular shows those towns they would get you know a fraction of of my singing voice and um you know i'd I'd lean more on like nils's singing and i had some pretty interesting interpretations of of singing where some were like all i had was my like ah you know it's like upper upper kind of whispery register mm-hmm. so i was doing all this like whispery register suddenly the song is going to sound like this you know <laughs> and then ones where my voice were my voice was just really low and then and, and you try to just like have fun with it i'm i'm a method singer you know so i'm <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to just let it um let it go where it needs to go and that's definitely helped me not be stressed about it because if I was to be more precious about my voice and what I thought it needed to sound like I'd have who I would have had a lot of reasons to be concerned you know for um, yeah do, do you have a set routine for warm-up before a show do you tend to warm up in a specific way or does it vary um I have I have pretty light stuff that I do I have um, the the best the best warm-up though is just doing about a, about a week week and a half into tour where you're just doing a lot of singing and then you you get all the cobwebs out of your voice and you're very warmed up um to where i don't feel like i have to do really any warm-ups before the show itself um i do some very simple um you know little bits of uh little bits of scales and um do some real like, oh, oh, you know, kind of my loudest stuff and oh, you know, that kind of, but I don't go off into a real long thing about it. And, um, and then as the tour continues, I, I find I don't need to do much warming up at all. And it's such a joy to get to that point where your voice is truly warmed up just because you've been singing enough. In fact, I wanted to, I would like to communicate that to other um, singers out there that have felt frustration with this or have some idea people who are just starting out singing or you know that feel some frustrated idea with their voice like oh it's just you know i can't i don't have much control over it or it's not you know making the kind of sounds i want until you really really use your voice a lot you you can't know what it does and and having a band um and doing some band rehearsals and doing a show you know once every couple months or even once a month it's it's just not the same thing as actually going out and singing five nights a week, you know. Um, yeah. You really have to sing a lot to really, uh, really see what your voice can do. And I, I honestly like there was there was so many different voices that came out of me through the years of touring that I had no idea. I wouldn't have thought that that was <laughs> that was anything that I mm-hmm. I had in you know for the singing I would play around with growing up and different, you know, band rehearsals and, and even just like early, you know, like listening to early song and hearing my voice in that. And I can hear my voice over the progression of the albums getting, getting more, you know, where I was doing just like a lot of singing and um, certainly like family album was a time where I was really interested in just pushing it. I just wanted to push into like extended vocal techniques, if you will. So, um, you know, and and I can hear all that, but, yeah, it's just it's it's time, and there's there's a natural growth and and maturity that that happens. I think with everyone's voice, um, so people owe it to themselves to you know just let themselves sing more, just you know allow their voice to um, to sing more and and let it mature and you know give it time. It is interesting. I've heard more people saying that as well that they don't have to warm up at four every show. And I I know the classical method, a lot of the more classically trained singers will be very adamant, like you gotta warm up and warm down at the end of a show and before and all this. 
And I always feel like for myself when I do warm up a whole lot that it feels like I've already sung so much before I've actually started singing any songs that by the time I sing of you know a handful of songs, my voice is already kind of tired. Whereas if I warm up maybe just like a few minutes and just get right into the songs or use sometimes what I've found is fun is to do just songs that are easier to sing to start with and that's essentially the warm up, you know, kind of make it a progression of the easiest to the getting harder. I find that's almost a more of an effective warm up than sitting there with a bunch of scales and stuff, which yeah. I do find that, you know, traditionally a classical teacher will tell you, okay, well now you got to do your do, re, mi's here and then here, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, did it's you ever, true. Do you have, did you, do you find that yourself at all? Does it seem like if you were, if you try to do like a lot of warm up before that it seems like the voice has already kind of worked too much before it's going to go and then sing a bunch kind of a feel? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, I think so. I think so. I, I felt that way. Um, and yeah, I guess I also just feel like the actual, the actual singing of the songs is, is really like, is, is the work, you know, it's like, is like the warm up and, um, yeah and uh, yeah yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know i think i guess i haven't gotten too exhausted from from warming up but maybe just a little ant just a little um restless with it i get a little bored with <laughs> with warming up um and sometimes just like you know like some good hot tea like that's a great thing to have for so there is there is the thing though that when you're in the thick of doing a lot of shows um to not do a lot of talking i have found that right. to be effective and that's a hard one because especially if if you're traveling with your family if you're seeing friends at the different towns um you know if you go out to the merch table it's it's all stuff that makes you like do a whole bunch of talking talking can can tire tire things out so i try to have hot tea I have lozenges, you know, like I used to try to have like lozenges around the merch area. So when I go and work the mer merch area, I just immediately, you know, pop a, pop a lozenge in mm -hmm. the mouth and just, <laughs> you know, just start right away, just that soothing of, of the throat. And the thing that will make my voice just be canceled out pretty good is if I get sick. If I get a cold, it's amazing how quickly it changes you know otherwise just by use maybe it gets a little it gets raspy it gets kind of kind of varnished but it usually it's kind of a neat thing and i can still yeah. i have my notes and um or if i'm noticing my highest notes i'm starting to lose usually there's a, like when a day off comes and i'll just really take it easy and and that usually is all all it needs is just some rest um but if I get a cold and I do, you know, I'm coughing and my throat hurts, whew, I'll have maybe one more show in me, one or one and a half, one, and then it'll just be just, uh, it'll be really quite, quite gone. So I do try to avoid getting sick. Yeah, that, that does seem to be a, a real, like, uh, sort of a the death sentence for some singers if they're on a really big tour, high profile tour, and they get the flu or something. It uh, really can bring bring down the bring down the show quite a bit but yeah. do you have any is there a specific song that you found is like your your most challenging to do live the one that's like the that proved to be the the real difficult song or is is it kind of like there's a certain level that's the most difficult and you kind of don't try and go beyond that too much or, or how does that work mm-hmm mm -hmm. um let me think there's parts of a carousel with Madonnas that's that's really hard. Um, Magnif that ee, like if I really want to try to hit that hard, um, that often that often does some does some damage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've had um, like Mother and a Piano has been has been pretty intense. Um, you know, even outing in the county, which sometimes that just feels great, but sometimes uh, just the ongoing, you know, this like ongoing quality of it. Um, Violet is actually a, quite a hard song to sing. Um, and, you know, you'd think like Eyes of a Bird would be a, a hard song, but there's something about the way it's kind of, 
it's kind of loose and it goes into it's kind of a relaxed high belting style so if i if i get if i get the the juju going with it then it it feels good to do um of course if my voice is really tired i, I can't do the ending stuff you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well my ah, you know all that like long-winded you know uh, yeah uh stuff that's that gets that gets harder um and I'm trying to think if there's any other, I feel like there's a, a few other songs where just, yep, yeah, definitely the ending for Eyes of a Bird. Um, even more kind of the, the stuff that holds out the notes as it goes into that, that ending kind of repetition thing. And then the, of course the, the feet, the, you know, the, the banshee kind of feline scream at the end. That comes in all kinds of different ways at times. <laughs> I just have to go for it like, well, let's just see what's there, you know that was created out of touring because i would never think to try to sing that way you know um and it was just out of some impassioned you know moment on tour where it had been building over over the tour over the different shows and at one point it just kind of slipped up into that um and i suppose i was i was enjoying a lot of like flamenco and um had been hearing about like actual extended vocal technique um, with the idea that where the break, where the breaks in the voice happen is where the spirit has a, has a chance to enter. Um, and so I really like that. So the idea to try to go where your break is, which usually is something that's um, really frightening for most people singing you know yeah. like, ah, I, don't want to, I don't want the break <laughs> um and so it, to actually go for the break with the idea that you're going to be bringing yourself to a kind of vulnerable place and a kind of a place of that's going to go into a different uh realm of of senses kind of losing control in a sense. I was just fascinated by that. So I think that's that's in you can kinda of hear that in different parts of family album. And that's where like with Eyes of a Bird that came out of out of that kind of a uh, time period. Yeah. So well it's sort of that willingness to to take that risk, right? Because I think, as you say, so many singers are afraid of the break area of the voice, and there's so much talk about how do you smooth over the break, how do you get you know past the break in the voice kind of a thing. Uh, was that something, were you also kind of, when you were first singing a lot, is that something that you were, uh, did you struggled with at first, or was it something that you were always kind of willing to try to mess around with more? No, I definitely struggled with it at first, and I, um, yeah. There was a lot of like, you know, frustrations and limitations I found with singing. Uh, great singers, I, I wanted to sound like how they sounded. I couldn't do it. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's still like, for me, my my whole approach with it has been so kind of visceral and unorthodox that there's things I've found that. I don't know even exactly how I've found them, um, but I explore, and um, that I, I guess I kind of like it that way. I kind of I like feeling like it's like it's this universe full of mysteries still. So for me, there's even like I'll hear people that'll have these tones that I know I could I kind of can get a, a feeling in my body where where it is that they're singing from, but there'll be things that I don't I don't know how I don't know how they do it or how to get there myself and it's kind of a neat like oh maybe I'll maybe I'll I'll find that in some moment and sometimes there's moments in shows where you're so warmed up and you're so inspired and you're going off into something um that you hear yourself do things you didn't know you could do and you've probably experienced that too right where you just you're you're going off into something like oh wow there's my my voice is is showing me what it can do <laughs> that I didn't know it could do, um, and I have to say that that's that's one of the wonderful things about about singing is that this pure experience. And I don't know if I 
I especially get it when there's an audience there, you know, when I'm yes, yeah. something created with, with listeners and, um, but where it's just so purely being in a, 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 a present, a present moment, like an ele- elemental present moment. And I like to call it, it's kind of like eating the air too, where just once you're really warmed up and you can just sing a song and there's no, there's no figuring about it. There's no like, oh, okay, do I do this? Now what comes next? What are the words? You just are the song. Um, that is such an incredible joy. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's got to be some kind of elixir, like tonic for life, you know, like so healthy, mm-hmm. you know, to, to do it. Well, it does feel for me whenever I'm singing around people that a lot of the concerns, all the little overthinking things I have about my singing kind of fall away uh, because you're just there in the moment and the, you know, and, and a lot of times I've even had times when I'm kind of taking a lesson or I'm trying to demonstrate something I'm struggling with. But when I try and demonstrate in front of someone, it says it's not there so, like, because the energy, I suddenly have this energy that, that kind of overcomes that. And I think a lot of it is because practicing by your, like for me, I, if I'm practicing by myself a whole bunch, it's so much easier to get caught up in those mental habits of like, well, maybe, the, maybe I'm reaching a little bit too hard here or doing this. And, and then that, that isn't as much of an issue if it's, if that, if you're really in the moment, which I mm-hmm. think is, uh, has made a big difference for me to start to figure that out. Um, but kind of going off uh, from the idea of what was a challenging performance, are there any uh, vocal performances you've done that you're especially proud of on record, like a studio one where you think this is one that I think is just one of my favorites I've done kind of a thing? Yeah, um, gosh. Well, I often... I often get, you know, really nitpick with, um, you know, when I've had the luxury, I, I usually do give myself the luxury to, to really explore um, the vocals and make sure I really like the vocals before I say, yes, okay, that's that's it. That's the final one. Sometimes being in, in a studio on someone else's dime and, you know, I, I'll, I'll move quicker or like you just know there isn't much time to, you know, to fuss over things. So you have to kind of go for it. Um, but do you want me to give you some examples of ones that I especially like the yeah, vocals? Sure. Um, I do like the vocals for eyes of a bird. Um, Hollow in the home and violet. Those are, those are two of my favorite. And, and um, forgetting the, the the name of my own song um oh mary hmm. um yeah that's those are all ones where I, I just felt like the group vocals the whole basic riding riding the wave of the energy was on um yeah that i those are ones that i, I enjoy hearing you yeah, know when I, when i hear them again yeah, that's uh, that's good to hear. I, those are some some classics right there as well. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, it was in, recently I, I had, was listening to Born of the Sun again for the uh, first time in a little bit, and it was interesting to hear just how different some of the vocal lines in that are too. I can really hear some of the kind of uh, influences that I didn't hear on some of the earlier ones, even like the, I think that forgetting the name of the song for me, track two off that album which is, I guess, kind of like the first full song, I do hear more of that, almost a little bit of a John Anderson phrasing style in that, which I, I didn't really hear as much on the er- earlier stuff. Does that, co- that come to mind when you were working on that, or is it something that uh, is it, just kind of, I guess, happened naturally and wasn't mm-hmm. thought about that way? You know? It's interesting you should mention John Anderson because just recently I've been consciously inspired by him as a singer, uh, wanting to emulate him, especially in the midst of the dregs of shelter in place and all that, and uh, hearing yes, and just feeling so uplifted by his voice and just the energy of yes, and like, man, I need this right now. This is just hitting the spot, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I will say, with the the flexi disc I did, the song, um, fairy song uh, for Fiddler's Green, definitely drawing upon John Anderson, and I think you'll hear that for sure. Just his yeah, his his brightness and um, I wanted that. 
And I want to draw on it more. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, why not? Right? Um, yeah, yeah. But I'm trying to think of what the second, what, what is this song? Gosh, Born of the Sun. I haven't heard it for a while. Is it a dune? No. Oh, I think, yes, it is. It is, yeah. Oh. You dune, yeah. Why do you and that one? <laughs> Wow! Yeah. Okay. I could I could hear the John Anderson influence. Not it wasn't conscious. Um, I think that one. I, I that that kind of a vocal for me. I put in the category of a kind of a wind windswept kind of Sandy Denny kind of um, bit of a Sinead O'Connor like you know sometimes the that hard uh, singing to the winds, you know, and a bit of a Celtic feel and. That one definitely was going to be very elemental because of all the references. To, I, I wrote the song with a particular uh, nature image in mind. Um, and it just, it kind of informed me what, what the rest of it was, was going to be. And it was a, it was a name that I really wanted to um, put, I wanted to give to my, my third daughter but I felt like it wasn't quite right for her, but I loved I loved the name so much. I thought, well, write a song about it. That's another way oh. to enjoy, you know, a name that you like and to have a reason to say it a lot, you know, um, if you put it in a song. So, yeah, that, that one, I think I was thinking more of I would I would think it was more kind of in the Sandy Denny in, inspiration and some Sinead O'Connor inspiration. <laughs> I, I can see that too, actually. When I think of it, it's true. I it wasn't what immediately came to mind, but uh, that is that's something I think is uh, kind of neat to hear is how someone else interprets it versus how the, the actual artist interprets it. You know, kind of a fun yeah. dichotomy to observe. But um, yeah, and um, and kind of on the I, with the idea of of songwriting and, and we talked earlier a little bit about kind of how early song was your the first songs you had done and uh, that you were playing and singing at the same time um how did did you find that playing and singing at the same time was something that did come naturally and is that something you've kind of you've worked as because for me i always find that doing both at the same time is very much more difficult than doing them separately i still always find that i have to very much write a lot simpler if I'm going to play and sing at the same time. Have you have you found that your approach to doing that has has developed, and and how do you work at that? Mm. I got into playing percussion a whole lot in recent years, and that kind of that that brought me away from the work of singing and you know playing a like playing guitar at the same time. And then I started missing the guitar and wanting to get back into doing that. Um, I'm trying to think. It it wasn't it wasn't entirely easy to to start. It was definitely it was it was a hump to get over for sure. Um, but I think because I had started with piano as a, a little kid, the idea of having like hands the two hands doing something else you know two different things and and singing at the same time and it kind of felt it felt right you know it felt good um i mean i think any any time that when, once i start trying to play solo which i haven't really done for a while i haven't done like a solo performance for a while i'm always aware of that awkwardness much more and that's where the support of having at least one other musician to play with is really helpful I, yeah, I, I, it makes you feel like you're not left to, out to dry, so to speak. It's like, oh, what are you going to do? There's nothing between me and the audience, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all on me, the entertainment now. <laughs> yeah. It's just a bit, a bit of a demanding feeling. I've never had to be in that situation myself. I always had, like, a band to hide behind, which I've always thought, yeah, the idea of... I did do... Well, no, because I did a few open mics not too long ago, and that was a whole new experience for me, was the idea of just, you know, just having the instrument by itself, not having anyone there to pound away and make it, you know, <laughs> drown out any mistakes, kind of, it's a whole different dynamic, isn't it? Yes. Uh, is that really... Is that something you might you think you might do more of, and or, or I guess kind of following on that note in general, is there a plan to do some mu music outside of the Fawn Fables name, do you think? Yes. 
Um, I, I have a, I have an interest to do uh, various collaborations. Um, you being one of the people I would like to collaborate more with. Yes, I yes, hope to share that with all the <laughs> listeners of Behind the Screams at Home. Look out for it on your way. <laughs> um, and I think also, you know, being able to being able to play solo well is something to always keep on hand if you can. So I foresee that Nils is rock music is going to get more active again in the near future there's been kind of a kind of a break there especially because of family responsibilities um for various you know members of the group and but now i think it's gonna i think they're gonna start coming together more and so that that always reminds me like yeah i need to be able to to play on my own but also um feels like a good time to to get in touch with with people that I've wanted to do different collaborations with and um and I think people are kind of more available right now actually because their bands are you know their touring and everything has been stilled so oh, yeah. um yeah it's it's a good time to you know contact people and hey yeah remember that thing we always said we were going to try to do with each other you know, <laughs> you know the time and yeah yeah thinking about the collaborations makes me remember there's a recording that you did with brian uh back i think it was probably 2005 or something in that area and you did a bunch of covers you did like u2 and you did uh, zeppelin yeah. and stuff like that that would be interesting to hear kind of more of the cover side of of what you do as well because i like it is usually reinterpreted like when you did children of the sea with on Fable some years back and stuff like that. Do you have any songs you'd really like to do versions of that you haven't got a chance to? Yes, I've I've thought about doing actually some Barbra Streisand numbers. Oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, some some Barbra Streisand songs and um, maybe some Led Zeppelin. And I've thought about you uh, too because that was such an influence, like early early influence like when I was about 11 years old starting that was my first you know band that I bought an album of that wasn't from wasn't something my older siblings you know Ooh, yeah. were buying albums it was my my thing my first thing and um, just really went inside the timbres of of Bono's voice and um, just kind of knew that early material just inside out just total intimate confidant like it was it was in my, my early years so um yeah um you know there's definitely some i thought about putting together too a kind of a, a a compilation of just various like great singers that have inspired me uh different songs different songs from that um and some songs that have to do with of oh, the, the things that i've been missing the things that i've been homesick for during this shelter in place time you know yeah. songs about you know going to a fair and um you know being out in the country and going to town and being able to buy some you know chocolate and see people and you know just just the real like really simple things and and i think that's what this time has has made me appreciate is how much just really just basic stuff with other humans is just just lovely you know this is, is so much so much where a lot of a lot of simple joy comes from it's true i like that there is that connection now to songs like that that they're even you know that, that may have been taken for granted before and now they sort of serve this new purpose don't they sort of also yeah. i guess goes to also goes for any of the songs from the past that were written about plagues and etc i've seen a lot of people that are so like hey you know we didn't know just how relatable these songs would eventually be <laughs> i know really we always heard about those like distant you know the black plague and the you know we always heard about this stuff I was like wow now we're, we're getting a chance to know not every generation gets a chance to to know yeah a pandemic yeah exactly um, but so I kind of uh, coming towards the end of the main questions I had, but I was also wondering a little bit about something Nils had talked about with 
what you've been working on. It sounds like that maybe we might get to see some more songs from the Limpy Glens saga, it sounds like, possibly making a reappearance. Is that true? Would that be fair to say? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the songs is going to make an appearance for the first time on, on a Drag City compilation. They're doing a From the Vaults compilation of different Drag City artists uh, pulling out old songs that were recorded and never released. I'm not sure when that's going to be coming out, but that'll be, yeah, I think it's going to be pretty soon though. Um, they're just waiting for everyone to gather their tracks. And there's some writing from, from that little, little opera, I guess what we can call it. Well, it was more, maybe more of a musical, like a rock musical. Um, there's definitely some writing from that 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 could continue to be. We we could we could still borrow. Probably changing the lyrics though. That's what I would want. Some of some of the stuff was just just silly, kind of absurd <laughs> lyrics, content. We're, we're working with high schoolers, and you know. Um, but yeah, there's definitely there's there's some potential. There's some potential there. Maybe though, it might be the thing just to kind of work on this next. You know, if there's a desire to work on any any uh, musicals and things that would be to, to work on the new new writing, like with the um, Elfrida, that's that's the name of the song with Fiddler's Green, the Flexi Disc song. Yeah, I was wondering about that because the song Mountain from the, the Born of the Sun is one that I really like. And I know I, from what I understand that comes from that, that writing yeah. session. So I'd be interested to see what else came about from it. Because I do remember in general, all the songs that I heard from it were really good, so. Uh, it's an interesting uh, sound the wild happening kids, there. Yeah, the Wild Kids rant and uh, Oh My Stars. Um, I'm trying to think of what was another one. Oh, actually, Goodbye Boring Town was. Oh, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, we did take several from that. That's, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's an interesting piece of uh, writing that you did there and I also in general I just like the fact that you, so, you have so much theater in your music already too it's pretty cool you got to just write a musical <laughs> like that and yeah then, and didn't you not too long ago you actually did you perform also in in a musical too another one that I think you I can't remember what this one was called I remember hearing about this a few years back do you, you know what I'm talking about is it make-believe I, I, it... I believe so yes yeah and that one um uh, there's also we also played music on the we also you know sing on the um, the actual recording of it we we made it onto the cast recording so oh, that's awesome. that's that. yeah that's a uh, Dalrymple McAlpin yeah and that's we should try to get a link or something for that'd be a good thing to include because that's it's a great it's a great album a lot of fun a lot of fun voices there's giants and there's Baba Yagas and yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. No, the, the whole kit and caboodle, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was that much different doing a musical like that? Did they? It was the experience particularly different from how you've done uh, preparation for your own music compared to that, or was it pretty similar? Uh, it, it was it was kind of similar, except that I didn't write it, um, and it it was nice that you know someone else had done all the work of. The writing and the staging and rehearsing and securing the, you know, performance place and that was nice to just kind of jump in and be able to just play a character. I did feel after the show was established and we were just kind of doing the run, um, I, the singer in me was like, "Oh, I, I want, I want more. I wanted to, I wanted more challenge, you know, because mm. I just had my part and um, definitely wanted to just." kind of do do more writing and, and be doing more singing in it that was what I, I felt a little i started feeling a little restless like oh i would i would i would need more more singing more challenge with the singing and um more intensive stuff to to really keep keep on something like this that's someone else's writing you know um yeah that sounds makes sense to me because it is you would think a little bit more limited to what's there on the page versus when you have your own piece you can kind of improvise around with if you want to which is yeah. certainly nice um okay well, last question i have for you because this is something i feel like i must have been told at some point but i don't remember who how do you go about translating those polish songs ah yeah. <laughs> well 
yeah, at some point, um, I had, there was a Fawn Fables fan that was Polish, but living in America, um, that got in touch with me. So what happened was for Carousel with Madonna's, let's see if I can remember this, uh, I had found out that there was someone knew someone Polish living in the Bay Area. And, but they weren't that familiar with uh, Konietzny's songs. So I got in touch with them. And it was literally like I met them at a train tracks. It was like I had to like walk down the train tracks and like, and he was walking like the opposite direction. And I had a little cassette that had carousel with madonna's in the original polish and i handed him the cassette um he listened to it and i think he wrote me an email or something with just uh the literal interpretation of the lines and it was very you know it was just very very simplified um it would never do to try to just sing the english meaning Right, that's uh, what I was thinking. <laughs> so what I had to do was to really rewrite it in English and try to match the Polish syllables. And often I had to add a whole bunch of content, like had to try to embellish upon. No, not. I never wanted to like make a bunch of content that wasn't implied. But sometimes I had to really kind of continue just to fill it up because the English would be a lot more simpler, a lot less syllables per line. Um, so I, I did that once with that fellow and then it was, you know, it was put out on, on the record. And I did, I did end up getting in touch with Zygmunt Konietzny, the, the composer, not the, not the lyricist, it's actually from a poem. Oh, and I, I don't have the fellow's name who wrote the poem at hand, but it is credited on the album. Anyways, but I sent um, the song out to this Polish kind of song, music org organization that copyrights, you know, copyrights uh, Polish, Polish musicians' work and just said that I was looking for permission to be able to put it on an album. And they got directly in touch with Zygmunt Konietzny, and then his translator got involved with me. Oh, uh, wow. got, got in touch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and just got in touch and said, Oh yes, he's he has heard this song and, and he likes it very much and he would love for you to, to do a recording of it. So that was really that was great. And then I, I kept in touch with her and when I went to Poland sometime later, actually to do some work with a Polish theater group, um, I was able to arrange through his translator uh, meeting with him in Krakow out at a outdoor cafe like we we sat for like three hours in Krakow and just with her there too and talked and it was just wonderful he was just this like jolly kind of elf of a man you know oh, awesome. like just kind of always smiled you know and just short short white hair and just very um kind of dapper and very energetic and just seemed really, really healthy, you know. So that was great. This Then the other ones, someone wrote to me that lived up in Seattle that liked Fawn Fables and, you know, noticed that I had a Polish song and, and kind of offered to, you know, to do more translation stuff. So I said, it was great because I, I do have a bunch of other songs uh, of his of his musical writing that I would love to do. So then I would just, I would send them, you know, the, the Polish, and again, they would, same thing, they would just say with the basic interpretation and give me some cultural context too, like some of it they'd say, yeah, you know, this, this is hard to translate because it kind of ends up meaning, you know, this and this, although it's not really said that way, but that's what you should try to imply in how you rewrite it. So then I would have the work of rewriting it again with the English syllables and and where the accents were, you know, trying to match that. Sometimes I, I don't think I really, I made it work out that great. But like we actually just recently, one of the things that we tracked that's gonna, that'll be on the next album is uh, another Zygmunt Konietzny song called Black Angels. 
Oh, nice. And it's super fast. There's a part of it, um, you know, they escaped out through a hole in the roof, the angels of death wearing heads of snakes, flying, uh, flying around like a boat. It just, it's really fast. And um, yeah, some of that I think is pretty, my English translation is pretty clunky, but <laughs> <laughs> it was the best I could do. Well, I was thinking about being Carousel of Madonna's, of course, is very fast as well. So <laughs> it's kind of yeah. one of the fun things about it. But yeah, I'm, I, was, I was wondering about that because I, I realized I, I don't know if we'd had that conversation before, but Sounds like there yeah. are a variety of variety of factors involved with the reinterpreting as opposed to just literal translating. It's really fun to do that work too. Like I I love that. Like you know, figuring out like it was like a puzzle. Like okay, I have this many syllables. This third syllable is really where the accent where it really comes out. I need some hard consonants in that syllable. Hmm. What what can I use? How and it has to have this basic meaning to it. So it's, yeah, it was, it was really fun. It's really fun work to do. Oh,